Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today, we're going to be looking at a new statement released by Dr. Brown and uh, a group of uh, charismatic leaders responding to some of the NAR criticisms. It's very similar to uh, the prophetic statement that they released on the prophetic standard statement. So we're going to take a look at it. It's going to be an exciting show. You guys stay tuned. You are watching the Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. I mute myself because I'm a professional. Anyway, we got an exciting uh, program for you guys today. Uh, we're going to be talking about this new statement on apostolic and prophetic leaders and, and kind of how that shakes out and what our thoughts are on that. It's going to be an exciting program. Before we dive into it, I want to remind you, Remnant Radio is crowdfunded. You want to support the channel? You want us to help make and create charismatic content, help you thinking through these issues that are coming up in our culture? Uh, maybe think about supporting the channel. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. As those five bucks a month, you get access to extra content if you choose to give on Patreon. Uh, also, we have a healing and deliverance conference March 2nd through the 4th. Uh, that's Remnant 2023. You need check it out myself michael roundtree dawson gerald michael miller the remnant crew are going to be down in north carolina doing a healing and deliverance conference if you want to know things about deliverance casting out devils uh healing the sick this is the conference to be at go check it out link in the description I just really encourage you guys, make sure to like, subscribe, share the content, uh, because we want to help charismatics think deeply uh, and grow in their knowledge uh, of God's word and the power of God's spirit. Uh, so this would be the place to do that. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to the fellas. Uh, the fella in the middle there is Michael Miller. And on the far right, there's Michael Roundtree. Since Michael is going to kind of be driving the show today, Roundtree is going to be driving the show today, I might toss it over to Michael Miller first for introductions. How are you doing there in Oklahoma? Oklahoma, <laughs> Denver. That's how you have to know. Tossing to Roundtree first. You wish, bro. I don't believe Oklahoma I've left the basement so much better in 10 years. than Colorado. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, have, like, I'm good, no man. Oxygen in those I'm, mountains. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm crazy busy this week. So I've been solo with the kids since Thursday. Uh, Michael flew in with his son on, it was also Thursday, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And I preached on Sunday. So we went and hiked, we went and hiked a mountain. Uh, Michael's son killed it, by the way. Totally just scaled a 13,000 foot peak with no problem at all. Didn't do how does heavy. one kill a mountain? That's intense. That's how, that's how strong he's he is. He's cold blooded, uh, bro. Yeah. He's, he's a, he's a crazy hiker. And then, um, yeah, we've already filmed one podcast today and here's another one. And yeah, gosh, there it goes. So Yeah. Well, I, as interesting, I kept, I was getting like people tweeting at me, texting me, emailing me about this statement on the new apostolic reformation. Of course, we're, we're always talking about the new apostolic reformation because it's, uh, the, the label is used to sort of characterize all who are maybe hyper charismatic. And, uh, we've done lots of episodes on this, but some people use the label in such a way that essentially all charismatics fall into this new apostolic reformation. It's a term that was coined by Peter Wagner, a former seminary professor at Fuller theological seminary. And, uh, and, uh, according to, uh, Holly and Doug, who've both been on the show, wrote probably the uh, hallmark book on this subject. I think it's just called The New Apostolic Reformation. I can't remember what it's called off, off the top of my head, but we've all read it and, and done shows on it and interviewed them multiple times. But uh, we all found the book to be uh, pretty insightful, which is maybe strange for charismatics because usually charismatics get a little defensive over the book. Uh, we found the book to be uh, pretty insightful. We had some disagreements as well, and we detailed those before. Um, but uh, as it turns out, there has been a, a response on the part of some uh, some leaders, specifically Dr. Michael Brown, uh, who kind of rose to prominence during the Brownsville revival and afterward, and uh, has a, a radio show and podcast, that kind of thing. Uh, and then Joseph Matera, a uh, pastor in Brooklyn. And so as this new apostolic reformation chatter has, it's, it seems to be like building and building and snowballing and snowballing. And, uh, and now as we're entering into the 2024 election, kind of, uh, the, 
the this is this is just I want to read you a statement from Joseph Matera, um, one of the signers of this statement, to explain why they put this statement together. He says, "I've been getting very concerned that as 2024 looms, if Donald Trump runs for president again, those unhealthy prophetic voices might get louder again. The secular and evangelical press are starting to lump people like me and Michael together with all these extreme elements." And so they they break this statement down on the New Apostolic Reformation into two categories. So you saw he, he mentioned Donald Trump. So there's the addressing Christian nationalism category uh, and this idea that like, hey, if we get the Christians into power, then we can take dominion and, you know, bring the rule of Christ to earth and that kind of thing. And so uh, that dominionism that's common in some charismatic circles. Sometimes uh, the the seven mountains are mentioned uh, where government is just one of the mountains, but it seems to be kind of like the most prominent of mountains, but you also have like media and family and church and other things. Uh, anyway, so there's the seven mountains. So they're one side, they're addressing the nationalism. On the other side, they're addressing the concerning theology of the new apostolic reformation. And uh, we've talked about that concerning theology. And guys, I just got to tell you, I'm grateful for this statement. I'm feeling pretty good about this statement. It's not like necessarily I would have used every single word that they used, but um, and, and we'll talk about some of that. But man, on the whole, I, I think this is a fabulous statement and is really going to benefit the body or at least has the capacity to benefit the body of Christ if it can get more signers, but it has some prominent missing signers. We'll get to that too. Uh, Josh and Michael, I, I've talked a little bit, uh, just kind of by way of introduction, uh, introduced this, uh, this statement on the NAR made by Michael Brown and Joseph Matera. Do you have any responses to, based on either anything I've said or just kind of first initial knee jerk responses to, uh, to the statement that came out? Yeah. So my, uh, that's a, that's a complicated question because I think we've, we've interviewed Randy Clark, we've interviewed Dr. Michael Brown uh, on the, the topic of the NAR, and the three of us have all found it to be a helpful term, and they've not provided any sort of uh, replacement for uh, churches, charismatic churches in particular, that um, adhere to this kind of nationalism and or definition of apostle and or ecclesiology and practices, um, which is frustrating uh, in a general sense. Like, I, I wish... Obviously, they disagree with those practices, but they're unwilling to label those practices with any particular label that's helpful. And yet, um, they produce this statement. And so, my first, uh, you know, response, gut reaction before even reading it was like, okay, am I going to read a statement that basically denies that there is a category of churches that has this ecclesiology practice uh, or not? And then when I actually read it, I was like, this is great. Thank you for writing this. Um, yeah. Now, whether you deny that there's a term called NAR that's helpful or not, you still very much blank. I mean, like very clearly spelled out that you do not believe to these practices or these doctrines. And and honestly, leading the charge in that is going to set the example. It's going to keep. It's going to take those people who do have those beliefs and practices and put them in a category just by their failure to sign that's right uh the statement which i'm i'm thankful for yeah and and when we talk about nar on the program it's important that people know that we're not trying to find a boogeyman to blame or to attack but it's important for us to be able to say we're charismatics but we're not these charismatics and and by not having definitions and ways to define differences what ends up happening is we become as guilty as you know, Kenneth Copeland, who said X, Y, and Z, and did X, Y, and Z. So what we're trying to do is saying we're this, but we're not that. We believe in prophecy and tongues and healing and all these things. We do these things, but we don't want to be conflated with other people who are using those words but are actually doing very different things. I would just say that my only my only thought about this par that these paragraphs here that we're going to walk through um, is that these sections are really broad and. 
some people might reading this go, well, because it's so broad, I don't want to sign it because they're not really defining what an apostle looks like. It's just too broad. I didn't like this or didn't like that. I would just say, give the statement charity. It's trying to write a broad statement so it can appeal to all of the different nuanced positions and opinions on what an apostle is, right? So like visionary leader, I hate that word. Okay. But, but they're just saying, Hey, maybe you're looking at an apostle as a visionary leader. And it's like, well, they're trying to include include those people and their understanding of apostolic leadership into this statement. So for that, I say, even though there might be a language in here I don't love, it's like they're trying to be ecumenical. And for that, I think that it's a, it's a very well-written statement. I like it more than the prophetic standard statement that we read uh, last year when that came out. So yeah, I, but you I still like generally like positive. the prophetic standard statement. I very much generally like the, 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 the prophetic standard statement. <laughs> I wholeheartedly I, partially loved it. So we, we, we did a response to it and said, Hey, I don't like the way this paragraph and that paragraph is written. Cause it does sound like, um, real true prophecy can have errors in it. Like it was just not, it, it's, yeah, the meaning I, of it was good, it was, but the language I think could have been written better. Yeah. Well, I agreed with you, but I still signed it because I, I felt like I just having met with Dr. Michael Brown a number of times, oh, for sure. instance, I know his view of prophecy. He doesn't yeah, think too. that God makes mistakes. I felt like that was like yeah. a, you know, an oversight in the wording there, but I, I felt like the, the spirit of the message was, was right on. And, uh, you, with this, uh, so the new apostolic, let's, let's start. Cause you already touched on like the first, uh, facet. I, we're not going to cover every single facet of the, of the statement. You can look that up online. It's real easy for you. Uh, we're going to go through the majority of them and, uh, and just kind of one by one talk through them. And so Josh, so we're going to start with the, uh, with the NAR it's more on the ecclesiology theology side of, uh, of the new apostolic reformation. And then we'll get to the Christian nationalism side of it. Uh, in some ways this felt like two different statements. On the other hand, for those who are living in the charismatic world as we are, we actually see the the link between these Agreed. two things uh, because those who are strong on uh, apostles, prof. I mean, hey, we're strong on apostles, probably. We, we believe they still exist today, but but those who would fall uh, or maybe be categorized by some as NAR do tend to veer over here into dominionism in the this sort of nationalism expression. So we'll get to that. So there, there's a reason why they put these statements together. So here's point one. Uh, they, they define apost apostolic. So I'm, I'm going to just read the statement. He says, by apostolic, we're referring to visionary leaders who are missional fathering and pioneering, such as church planters, networkers, or movement leaders, often marked by their focus on gospel expansion beyond one local region. Such leaders are identified by their function, whether or not they use the term apostolic and whether or not they are Pentecostal or charismatic. Okay. So there, for me, there's, there's stuff about this that I like and stuff that I don't, um, but much more that I do. And, uh, I, I like that it's including like, Hey, even if you're not Pentecostal charismatic, even we, we identify, like, for instance, I think everyone on this show would say Charles Spurgeon, we believe that he that he was apostolic in sure. the way that he functioned. And I just use the word function just like they did. I like that they use the word function. They didn't use the word office. And so we've talked about this. We don't think the Ephesians 4.11 giftings really, uh, that it's ideal to talk about these as offices. We believe that the offices assigned uh, for everyday local church leadership are elders and deacons. And uh, we've talked about apostles, prophets, and how that functions. Uh, but but we really like the word function to talk about. So there's a lot that I like about it. But the, the one I really didn't like uh, was visionary leaders so much. Um, it has the feeling of a CEO, but I know that's not their heart. So no. I, I would not, not sign the statement on account of this. I feel like I would sign this statement. I just haven't done it yet. So Miller, um, talk to us about what do you think of this visionary leaders? Cause both Josh and I have, have commented on that. Well, I'm, I'm on the exact same page. I don't like the t the word visionary leader because well, when it has baggage from NAR books, NAR literature, um, you know, saying that this person gets the vision from heaven. It's like, you're not quite distancing yourself from that enough in my opinion. But then secondly, the very fact that he wrote a statement or they wrote a statement, let me just, I want to, I want to 
make sure I properly title it. It's called the, the article on stream.org says a collective leadership statement on the new apostolic reformation and Christian nationalism. So they're responding to two different things, but the very fact that they're using the label NAR is them adopting the term. Now, which is funny because I don't think they, they would have ever said that in the past. It's like, there's no such thing as NAR. Well, by, uh, by actually, well, they do, they do that. say kind of at the end of the, the theology section, they say, in short, we deny any affiliation with what is presently characterized as NAR in many circles of both Christian secular press. We also believe that rep reports of an alleged conspiratorial worldwide dangerous NAR movement are highly exaggerated and misleading. Uh, so Miller, Which do you think it's possible, do you think it's possible that they're using NAR because it's a handle that, that people can grab onto because it has been thrown out there, but not necessarily trying to say we actually believe NAR exists. Do you think that's possible? Cause I, I've well, heard I don't Dr. Think Brown they I don't think many they times seem it. to deny. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. But, but the, the very fact of them addressing a statement, distancing themselves from that, or the churches that would uh, be characterized as that is them using the term. Um, and so whether they find it helpful or not, they've adopted it on that level, um, which you and I are in agreement like with them. We don't think there's some sort of conspiratorial NAR movement behind the scenes, secretly working stuff like the Illuminati or, you know, those kind of things. Um, but, but the fact that they're using the statement again, it, it emphasizes that this is the term that's, that's done. It's the term is there, right? There's no running. From right. It now. But and I, so I'm going to volley this over to Josh. When they use the language of highly exaggerated and misleading, do you agree with that, Josh? Because on some level, we found uh, we found some of the criticisms toward NAR and the categorizations is helpful. I, I've heard you talk about that before, Josh, as we all have. So, uh, I mean, would you agree with this, this, that it's exaggerated and misleading or would you disagree? Depends on who we're talking about, right? Like, is it, it did Doug and Holly grossly exaggerate? No, I, I disagree with some of their categories. But there are people out there who do grossly rep misrepresent everything's NAR, this is NAR, that's NAR. Um, and that is a gross misrepresentation. But if we're going to take the, the very accurate, the very, I think, very accurate, charismatic side that we're saying, hey, we're not this, it's a group of people who have a an ecclesiological structure that gives them some kind of supernatural power. The people at the top of the structure, mainly apostles and prophets, are able to divine certain spiritual powers and in, 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 not just powers, but um, revelatory insights. Methodologies. To engage new doctrines, mm -hmm. new practices on how to to practice in the local church. And, and that is a very real thing. I don't think a single person who's ever signed this statement or wrote this statement will deny that that person I just described exists. And to call that group fringe, um, I think is a gross misrepresentation. That group is, they have a publishing house. They have multiple publishing houses. And, and almost every book that comes out of those publishing houses scream gnar all over them. So all that to say that no it's not just a few people it is becoming mainstream all of the trump prophets i mean it was hitting national news this isn't a fringe movement you go on youtube hundreds of thousands of views every video from these clowns and i i don't want to be i i've i have now violated scripture in in degrading you know christian speakers and stuff like that i don't want to degrade people and and i apologize for that but these these guys are are making a mockery of the faith, and it's 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 gone too far. So I'll say no. I don't I I don't think uh, I don't think that they're wrong in the way that they're saying that some people are exaggerating it. But I do think if you're saying that these charismatics who are inventing new doctrines and new practices that that is somehow not happening very popularly, I think you're dead wrong. Um, yeah, it's definitely I, I think it just it level. just depends. I think it just depends on what he means when he says. Yeah. Um, you know, we, de we deny any affiliation with NAR. Okay. That's, that's really one side of the statement. And then he says that, that reports of an alleged conspiratorial worldwide dangerous NAR movement are exaggerated and misleading. I mean, on some level, I, I mean, I can agree with that in the sense that like, I don't think there is a conspiracy of like, okay, guys, how are we going to get this NAR thing going? Okay, let's do this and that and this. I don't think it's so highly coordinated. There's not a NAR um, knock list. Right. You know? So in that sense, I agree with it. 
But I, I'm not sure that's what Holly and Doug and some of the greatest critics are saying, that, that it's necessarily this highly coordinated thing, because that's what conspiratorial would suggest. So um, I, I don't know. I wonder if there might be a little bit speaking past each other on, on that sure. statement. But I, I think on the whole, what he's trying to say is we don't affiliate that. And there are some big exaggerations going on with, um, with NAR and what it really is and looks like. And so I, I can agree with that. I, I do think there are some exaggerations on in some ways and other ways to your point, Josh and Miller, um, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of churches that really do operate in what I think a fair categorization of a new apostolic reformation. I, so I don't know, I, I guess I would need like a conversation with Dr. Brown to like fully know exactly what he was saying. Well, at, at the end of the day though, one thing is certain they are doing everything they can to distance themselves from, from those, those doctrines, teachings. those practices, that's right. and those who do them. And that's what matters. Well, I, yeah, that's what, exactly. that's what I'm pleased with. And which is why, uh, again, I would also sign this document. Yeah. So, so let's look at uh, some more of those statements. I'm going to read a couple in a row, and then we'll respond just for the sake of time. We reject the belief that the company, contemporary apostles carry the same authority as did the original 12 apostles. So we'll Amen. revisit that word authority. We reject the belief uh, that contemporary prophets have the exact same function or carry the same authority as did the Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. uh, and why don't we just tackle those two in a row? It's both of them are speaking to the authority of the apostles and the authority of the prophets, central tenets of the so-called NAR. Um, and they're saying, we actually deny that. So Josh and Michael, does this mean that they're right to distance themselves from the new apostolic reformation because they have a different view of apostles? Well, I mean, the, the careful people, even in the, NA, the, the NAR that were as, as has been defined at the top of the show, um, is that they, they believe that there is an authority. I don't know if any of them are going to say that they're equal to the 12. I, I haven't heard a NAR guy say, I have the same authority as Peter and John. I've heard them say things like, this is what Peter and John did, therefore that's what we're going to do. So there's a little bit of nuance there. I, I'm glad that they said, hey, we don't have the same authority as as Peter and John, as, as the original 12. And what that is, they're trying to communicate there is that um, we are we are not creating doctrines that are binding on the conscience of all people everywhere. Um, we are not inventing new teachings, new practices. Uh, and again, that that's clearly what they're trying to say here. And I would just, I would yes and amen that. Um, the, the question though on authority um, is interesting because they are still, are they still claiming that the apostles have some kind of authority? Um, and what do they mean? Do they mean spiritual authority? Do they mean um, ecclesiological authority? I'm just not sure. Um, are they saying that apostles today have some kind of ecclesiological authority over the church? I don't know, um, but it's vague enough to where I can agree. Yes, an apostle today does not have the same authority as an apostle in the first century or the 12 apostles in the first century. So you go, yeah, I agree with that statement. They also say that we reject the the authority of like Old Testament prophet or that the current prophets have the same authority as Old Testament prophets. Again, I'm, I'm curious what they mean by authority. I think they're probably talking about infallibility. Um, but I'm not sure because again, the authority of a prophet in the Old Testament I'd, I'd be curious what they, they have a, a footnote there that I probably want to read, but when you it say- It just says refer to the, uh, the footnote just says refer to the prophetic standard statement. Which probably means, yeah, that the prophecy is not infallible, um, is probably what they mean in that statement, uh, where- I would just say that a prophet in the Old Testament probably has the same kind of authority as a prophet in the New Testament. If the word can be judged and we know it's from God and it's tested and we know that it's from God, then we should obey it. We should listen to it. But not even the prophets of the Old Testament were writing scripture by their prophecy. So there might be, again, some nuanced difference there. Um, but again, I generally generally agree with the, the thrust of it. Miller? Yeah, I'm on the same page. Uh, this was this uh, referring to the prophetic statement. It, it's referring to the very part of the statement that we actually, or at least I disagreed with, uh, and that I don't think prophets are are infallible. I think God is infallible, um, and so. But it just depends again what you mean by authority. I don't know. Exactly uh, I don't think the that. prophetic standard statement said prophets are infallible. I think the wording though that you were talking about, there was a part. Josh, you might have it more clear than me, but I, well, I think it was why I didn't sign the they, statement. They they talked about prophecies being infallible, um, 
but I think where where we would distinguish and we would say the revelation is always infallible, but the prophecy includes the person's interpretation and application of that infallible revelation. And somewhere in that that process, it can become muddled. Um, yeah, I, that's kind of a lot to say in a standard statement. So I get it, but I, I think totally. that's what you're getting at, Miller. Yeah, and I I take the stance. Uh, you remember John Mark Ruthven, the author of. Uh, uh, what's wrong with Protestant theology and on the charismata? Um, he's recently passed away, but uh, he he says that there's two kinds of authorities here. There's prophecies as they're given, and then there's the written word of God, and they shouldn't be considered on the same authoritative level. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at on that. Um, but other than that, I, I I agree with this. I agree with, and I'm, again, I'm just thankful that they're distancing themselves from this by calling it out formally. Right. Now, I think for the critics, it's it's not going to be enough because, I mean, sure, like this is just what evangelicalism is. We say uh, like nothing has the authority of the original 12 apostles because they wrote scripture and scripture is our highest authority or Old Testament prophets. They wrote scripture and scripture is our highest authority. So, I mean, praise God, they're basically saying that the scripture is the ultimate authority and it trumps anything any so-called prophet of today says. So, I mean, yes, we're going to all easily sign off on that. But I think the critics are going to want more. They're going to want them to say that there is no authority at all for any sort of modern day apostle. An apostle is just kind of a missionary that goes out and, and plants some churches, but they don't have any sort of authority in it. Uh, and I think that you find some nuance within the new apostolic reformation where it's like, okay, well, we don't have the, uh, we don't have the authority of apostles, but there is a hierarchical authority with apostles. And I'm the apostle over this network and you're the apostle over that network and that kind of thing. And so I think the critics are, are not going to be satisfied with that. Nevertheless, uh, to your point, Josh, I think they're trying to include as many people as possible on the grounds of orthodoxy which right. says script, scripture's trumping all things and how we parse like the authority of modern day apostles and that kind of thing. They're saying we can leave that in the realm of debate. Let's just make sure that we have scripture at the tippy top. Round treaty. I think that this next statement that I have highlighted here in the document probably shows us what they mean by authority, where he says, we reject the belief that every church must be submitted to apostles and prophets to be in right order before the Lord. That statement right there probably shows us what they mean by authority. If the apostles today don't have the same kind of authority as the 12, and then says that we in our local churches don't have to be submitted, he is then claiming that apostles don't have authority over pastors and teachers and congregations. So uh, I think that statement is probably clarifying of the things that we read earlier. And it's probably talking about, again, doctrine in creating new things, because he's not talking ecclesiology, obviously, uh, by, by that statement there. I, I'd be curious if you had yeah. your respect to that. No, I, I, I think that's good. I And I love that statement. It's my favorite statement. <laughs> we've, we've been troubled by this idea that like, you know, hey, you got a little local church over here. They're putt putt along doing their thing, and then, uh, like, oh well, if you submit to this apostolic leader and the visionary download that he's received from heaven, then the blessings of heaven can trickle down to you, and uh, and so everybody's got to be submitted to this little church. And and so uh, Brown and Matera, they're saying, no, no, that's that's not a biblical concept. And so, uh, man, praise praise God for that. I I think that's a good observation, Josh. Uh, let, let me read this next one. See, Miller, I want to hear your thoughts on it, okay? Uh, it says, we further oppose the possible abuse of ecclesiastical, uh, ecclesiastical titles or ecclesial titles that manifest itself in self-proclaimed apostles and prophets claiming territorial authority over pastors in a community, city, or nation. Okay. Uh, Miller, thoughts? Uh, so this is a reference to the idea that so-and-so is the apostle of that particular city. And if you're going to be doing work in that city, you need to come under their apostolic oversight. I think it also has to do with the idea of apostles having the authority to take down demonic strongholds, you know, principalities. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with that one. And I don't, I mean, if, if I'm understanding those, that statement correctly, I'm in complete agreement. Um, and I don't really have much else to say. I'm just, again, thankful these guys have taken a formal stance and also acknowledging that there are people out there that do this. 
Oh yeah, yeah. There, there's a girl in our uh, our our spirit word and spirit course. Her name is Barbie. Her and her husband uh, were just starting prayer meetings in their local community, and a self proclaimed apostle came to them and says, "No one does any ministry in this city without my permission first. I'm the apostle what of in the this world. region." And shut yeah, down. That happens. Prayer That's not. Meetings. It's not. That's not the only time I've heard that. It's not the only time I've. I mean, it's wild. That is I mean, it's, sick. Like, it's here's disgusting. one from Jack. Jack got a letter in the mail, and the letter said, uh, oh, no. "Dear Doctor Dear, you may not view yourself as a as an apostle, but we do. And if you would like to join our apostolic network, you can pay such and such amount of dollars, no. and you can be part of the network." And Jack is like, oh my gosh. So I, was, I think this. Can I ask the, if I know who it was? Can I ask a name? Would you say yes? No, or no? it would have been great if Jack responded with, like, well, Actually, I took a loan from heaven and uh, I got it from the Lord in heaven. Oh, man. But it's only spiritual. So I'm going to have to give you that. Uh, in, in future times. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, here's why I say no, because I'm not 100% sure. I'm only like 80% sure who okay. it was. He told me one time in off conversation, so I don't want to catch I'm pretty sure I know the network, so I'm going to ask Jack next time I see him. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. and, and John Davidson, our, our buddy in uh, Cleveland, said he saw the same thing happen. Oh, yeah. Where people were told they need to submit to the apostle in the city if they really want to uh, come under the benefits of heaven there in that city. Which is foolish. Who, yeah, it's totally who, 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 who knows if that pastor of that church is the apostle or the pastor down the road is the apostle or, you know, like at what point like you just, you're just arbitrarily determining based off of maybe influence. It's certainly not off of apostolic secession. It's definitely not off of denominational, you know, organizational structures because you don't all fit under that organization. So they're just arbitrarily saying I'm an apostle and having a group of people who buy into it and that's that's all that it makes you an apostle like it's 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 foolishness um yeah absolutely okay so uh so so far we're loving this okay here's the next one we reject the belief that new revelation is essential for the life and growth of the church or the contemporary apostles or prophets are the only ones privy to such new revelation this has been a huge one that we've we've been hitting on this idea of like new revelation that only apostles and prophets can get. So oh, there's these lowly pastors and teachers here who happen to be entrusted with leading the church, the elders of the church. First Timothy five seventeen are to direct the affairs of the church. Okay, but but then we have this new ecclesiological authority. Like okay, so these apostles and prophets that paid one hundred and fifty nine dollars to be part of a network so that they can tell you that they got a down. <laughs> Download from heaven, and that because of this download, your church needs to do this, not that. And so now the elders are just kowtowing to the apostles so that the blessings of heaven can flow down. And so, uh, so all of that's terrible and it's abusive, but it's especially terrible when, when we're talking about new revelation that goes beyond the bounds of scripture, um, that uh, to the point of being unscriptural, uh, things like you know, spiritual mapping. And, and in order for us to reach this city, we have to have an apostle who can take down principalities uh, through the power of his prayers, as though apostles' prayers are more important or more heard than other people's prayers. And, uh, and so we're going to cast down this principality. So all of this is built as a new revelation, this strategic spiritual warfare, the spiritual mapping. And I look at it and I say, uh, it's actually unbiblical. When you look at Luke chapter 10 and Jesus sends the apostles out and, and they're casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead. And, uh, and Jesus says to them, I think it's Luke 10, 17, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And there's a little bit of debate over that, what that verse means, but I don't think that he's talking about a primordial fall of Satan because it has direct bearing on that context in which he's addressing, uh, just as, uh, revelation, uh, chapter, I believe it's two where, uh, or maybe it's three where, uh, now it's the end of two, where Satan's throne is in the city of Pergamum. Satan is not omnipresent. He has a, a specific location at a given point in time. And, uh, and, and so where, where I'm going with that is that, um, that Luke 10, 17, Jesus saw Satan's foothold being broken as the gospel was being preached and extended. And so, I don't see this sort of spiritual mapping in scripture. I see people preaching the gospel and pushing back darkness like that. But that's just an example of a new revelation that becomes uh, abusive and weird and uh, calling on people to do things that, uh, that are at least counterproductive. 
and uh and maybe a little dangerous too messing with principalities i i just i i wouldn't advise it <laughs> uh miller josh yeah what do you guys think about that so i've got two uh experiences well one experience and one story that i've heard that relates to this so um i don't know if this is actually a true story or if it's just some sort of thing that's made up but if it was true it wouldn't surprise me um but supposedly um during the potato famine in um europe ireland uh there was a i don't know if it was a, a monk or a church leader of some sort but supposedly he had a dream of a, a beer, a formula for a beer that would be nutrient rich and dense. And that became what is modernly known today as Guinness and it helped them survive the potato famine. Now, do I have any problem with a revelation coming to a person that would help people avoid a famine? No problem with that. Now, let me tell you my other experience, which is from my former church, where the apostolic leader had this vision for prayer and that's how this the city would be transformed and so basically he was running a prayer ministry rather than a church and calling it a church because he felt like he had the blueprint from heaven for this new form of church and new way of doing church i wholeheartedly disagree with that and i think that's actually what they're also addressing by rejecting that form of new revelation so in that sense i'm uh in total agreement any thoughts i am also in total agreement of the guinness revelation of the potato famine i think <laughs> i think anytime your apostle says hey i've got this new idea for a beer you go that's from god i don't know i just <laughs> i'd be suspicious i don't know it's just me i don't know i just i just uh no man i'm i i think that what's really important about this is that they talk about revelatory gifts first of all that these things are not exclusive to apostles and prophets this is what we get promised in joel 2 for all of god's people right uh he pours out his spirit on all flesh sons daughters young old and and to 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 get this excluded to a, just a select few i think is a uh it's not a it's not wise it's not biblical it's not healthy for the body of christ uh for us to to look at our relationship with god as some someone who who can be led by and can hear god and, and we're his sheep and we know his voice and we don't have to look to uh, a specific a specific group of people that will be in intermediaries between us and God, giving us the secret sauce and giving us secret insights that only they can uh, divine. Um, and I'm using those words intentionally for those of you who are upset with them, um, because I do. I do think that when you talk about only these people can have a revelation from God, you're getting dangerously close to divination, I think. Yeah. Well, and they probably wouldn't say only they can get any revelation, but I think what you're saying specifically, Josh, is the claim that only apostles and prophets can get this sort of, this is how we do church sort of revelation. That's exactly. where it gets dangerous. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I would have loved to see this statement, uh, condemn spiritual mapping and uh, to condemn strategic level spiritual warfare, those kind of things. But you know what? Uh, you can't get everything. I still like the statement. Uh, Holly and P Holly Pivik and Doug Givett did not like the statement. Here's what they had to stay, say. This was reported in Newsweek magazine. Uh, they say, many new apostolic reformation leaders have removed language from their website where they once described themselves as being part of the new apostolic reformation. And they've produced videos and issued statements downplaying their extreme teachings and claiming they're not part of the NAR. They've also accused critics of NAR of being conspiracy theorists who have either made up or exaggerated the size or dangers of of this movement, <clears throat> despite well-documented evidence to the contrary. As a result, Materian Brown's statement is, a, is gloss and spin and does nothing to diminish the real and serious concerns that have been raised by the critics of the NAR. If anything, it raises concerns about the tactics that have been increasingly deployed to defend the NAR and to deflect attention away from their teachings about authoritative apostles and prophets giving new revelation. Gosh. respond guys what do you that, think miller oof. you you have a visceral reaction already i want to hear it well i think they're right on some level i i do think they're right i think they're pointing out the fact that this has been a largely overlooked thing and holly and and doug have been made to look like they're over uh they're exaggerating the influence of this movement which is what we said at the very top of the hour on this uh video um so and 
And it is troubling to me that the that many, instead of just saying, I used to teach these things and do these things, I need to repent and make it right. They change their practice, that's good, but they never really like offer restitution and repentance for what they've already done. Instead, they just pretend like they never did those things. And that is that is problematic. That tactic is really wrong. I'm glad Holly and Doug have stated that. Um, I do also think they're failing to recognize the good in this statement, I which I, th I think we're doing. Um, they're, they're failing to say, yeah, but look at this. They're taking a formal stance against those practices. So Holly, your book, your book has actually accomplished on some level what you hoped it would accomplish. It's going to cause people to stop doing those things. And this statement is going to further stop people from doing those things. So, I mean, give it some credit, you know? Um, yeah, yeah I, it, I think it misses it, the forest through the trees. Too polarizing. I, I think I think that they they're so they're so eager for wanting a repentance that looks specifically like this that they can't acknowledge something else. Like this is a good move forward for the movement as a whole. And if the, if the aim is actually to correct error, um, this statement stands in opposition to the error that they are seeing active. Um, here, here's my thoughts on some of the website stuff. We all know that there are people who are practicing these things, believing in these things. We also know that there are people who use language loosely and would they, they would say, yeah, I love C. Peter Wagner and uh, he talked about new apostolic reformation and I, I want to see apostles, you know, active in the local church today and prophets active. Yeah, I'm a part of the new apostolic reformation. And then when the stink stirs up about all the new apostolic reformation stuff and all the people in the NAR, they, they believe in this and they teach this and they teach that as if it's some kind of monolith. And then they come back to their website and go, oh man, we have this on our website and this is this big old list of things, um, you know, uh, this big old list of things that NAR people believe and it's being defined now by this group. I don't want to claim that I'm NAR on my website anymore. If that's what people think of when they think NAR, I'm going to pull this down. I know people who on their church website, they were like, this guy gave us a prophetic word, uh, you know, to name our church, this and that. And that prophetic guy went wheels off and they're like, I still like the prophetic word, but I want people associating us with that guy. So they pulled the endorsement. They didn't need like a public, you know, repentance statement to, you know, once upon a time I put Paul Kane's name on my website, you know, I need a, you know, some kind of public repentance video. It's just, it's just silliness. It wasn't sinful what they did. It was just the, the name or the meaning of the thing changed in their eyes. So they pulled this stuff. And I'm not saying that's the case with all of them. I just, I think it's disingenuous to assume that because someone pulled something from their website, it's because they're hiding or because, you know, they see the validity of it and they don't want to be associated. I don't know. Like th there can be a thousand reasons that someone does something like that. I, uh, yeah. I think it, 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 it makes the charismatic, like they assume the charismatic movement thinks like people who've gone through like the Protestant Reformation and studied church history. And like the reality is <laughs> charismatic, charismatic leaders know, like for the most part, I don't want to, I don't want to, it's not just charismatics, dude. Take your average Southern Baptist. They sure. usually don't know. I, I just uh, mean that about the, church history. It's just kind of it, evangelicals have that reputation outside of like Lutherans and Anglicans. Uh, who are like kind of not really evangelicals. I mean, I, ish. I, just I don't need to know. Say that they're Depends. not precise in their theological language. That's all that I meant. Is like yeah. the vast majority of us will just use phrases that are broad that work. You know, right? Um, well, here, here's here was my thought. I I felt like the statement from Holly and Doug was harsh personally. I, too. Um, I I felt like when they use the language of gloss and especially spin to describe uh, Dr. Brown and uh, Joseph Matera, to me that's a character charge, and uh, because spin means you, it's like you you know the truth, but you spun it in a positive light so people wouldn't know the truth, and that's not what Dr. Brown was doing. Like I. I believe Dr. Brown believes to his core the things that he's saying in this statement and the statements that he's made about the NAR over the years. So I, I don't think this is a spin thing. I think this is just what he actually believes. And um, they now, to be fair, they might have intended spin not as a character assassination. They might have intended it 
as just kind of like it, he's not really understanding the depths of this, just to give him the benefit of the doubt. But normally that's what the word spin means. It's, it's a, uh, a negative word and it's, it would, it raises questions about their character. And I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, the other thing is when they say that it deflects attention away from their teachings about authoritative apostles and prophets giving new revelation. Uh, I, I don't see that it does that because their statement actually says, we reject the belief that new revelation is essential for the life and growth of the church or the con contemporary <laughs> apostles and prophets are the only ones privy to such new revelation. So it sounds like they actually said, I reject the very thing that Holly and Doug say they're not rejecting well enough. So um, if, if this is how they feel, I, and, and maybe they have somewhere else and I haven't seen it, but I would say, well, give us some clarification because it sounds to me like they did that. Now it could be um, that they're saying, Josh, I don't know what's so funny over there, but uh, it could well, be just hilarious. Saying, it's like they're not rejecting it, and then you read the sentence that verbatim says, "We reject this." It's just <laughs> okay. It's just funny to me. It's like at what point, like what hoop do you have to jump through to be like, "I have repented of this," or and yeah. I'm not even saying that they so, did this, but like they, so it, I don't. It feels to me like a little bit less than the charity than it, less than the charity that I would want to see yeah. for believing someone is a Christian brother or sister. And so I would just want to ask, uh, you know, Holly and Doug, do you believe Michael Brown is a Christian brother? I think you do. They do. Uh, and so uh, anyway, that felt a little bit less. But you know what? I'm not above above them. I sometimes say things I regret well, even on this show. It's, so it's, I'm just saying it felt a little strong. It, it is strong. And, and actually, I think the, the fact is all three of us think that Doug and Holly have written a really good book and they've done a really good job of documenting some of the practices and beliefs of this kind of church or this mm -hmm. kind of ecclesiology. Um, and what really frustrates me about it is their response, when they respond like this, where they're just saying, well, it doesn't do nearly enough. It's like, nobody's going to take you seriously if you keep doing that. They're all going to see, eventually people are going to walk away thinking you have an ax to grind rather than a... A valid case to bring forth and, and they're shooting themselves in the foot by by not offering more charity and not recognizing where people are taking a formal stand that's actually with them and not against them yeah, um, yeah. And again, I, I, I don't they're... deny that people are failing to fully repent i actually think that's really happening but this statement is is actually making progress it's going in the direction that they would actually want it to go in yeah and when i, I yeah. said earlier that this isn't what what do they have to do to jump through to repent I don't think Dr. Brown has anything to repent of. I don't think he's ever done this. I think what right. he's doing is making a statement saying, this is what we're doing. And charismatics who identify Dr. Brown as like this fivefold apostolic teacher or, or whatever a title they want to give him, they're like, well, he he says this and I trust him. I trust Dr. Brown. He's he's careful. He's I, I probably need to adjust the way that I'm approaching this, right? Like him making these statements is a good thing for the movement. And, and I do wish that you said that it's hard for people to take Doug and Holly seriously. I have a hard time now taking Doug and Holly seriously because of some of these things. I'm like, hey, meet me halfway here. Like we're we're moving in the right direction. When they say this is this is spin city, I go, man, that do you it, think I, it makes me it makes me wonder, do they are they just not charismatic? Like they don't believe that the gifts are for today. And so anybody who believes they can prophesy would be getting new revelation and that's what they're well they're coming in. If, like, I'm, I'm just really if that's the by case, that. then if that's the case, then they are contradicting their book. In their book, they cite a charismatic leader who talks about fivefold ministry and they're like, Hey, this is not our our position is not to destroy all charismatics. We don't think all charismatics are NAR. Um I mean they've said that over and over again. It's possible that there may be. Some Are they cessationist? Subtext. I'm pretty sure I've heard them say uh, that they have. I, I don't know. I can't, I'm, I can't speak. I'm pretty sure they are, yeah. but I, I think they try to be careful to say this is not all charismatics. So, but I, could it be that cessationist bias is affecting their view of this? Certainly. I mean, we could all be biased. Um, well, the very their very response is obviously asking us all or causing us all to ask that question because well, they're not giving right. an inch. Right. The, the fact that they're not giving an inch. So w what I'd love to see with Holly and Doug, and maybe they provided, I haven't seen it. Um, and, and I'm sure they'd be glad to provide it. And Holly and Doug, you're w welcome to come back on the show. But um, I'd love to see like, hey, this statement said this and we didn't like it. And it didn't say that. And we didn't like, like, this is what we would need to see in this statement for us to feel like this was a good statement. Because I, I almost like in some ways, I felt like uh, Matera and Brown read their critique of the NAR, agreed with a bunch of it, and said, 
we hate that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, right. So I, yeah. I kind of felt like, well, I kind of feel like you should be glad they hate that stuff. So, um, anyway, so I, I just, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with Holly and Doug about that. And there are Christian brothers and sisters. And I think they're doing some really great things. So, um, let me, doubt. let me touch on this, uh, Newsweek article. I want to come back to it. Uh, this is just a direct quote. It says the statement has 64 signatures so far as of when they wrote this article. Although none from the bigger names in the apostolic prophetic movement, such as Sidney Jacobs, head of, prayer, uh, of the Prayer Network, Generals International, California pastor and revivalist Shea Ahn, uh, and Texas evangelist Lance Waldau and Dutch Sheets, therein lies the difficulty these leaders face. What some believe are the more extreme elements have larger numbers of adherents. Ahn has 52,000 followers on Facebook, 25,000 on Twitter and a network spanning 25,000 affiliates in 65 countries. Sheets has 188,000 Facebook followers and 48,000 Twitter followers. And it goes on with, uh, you know, Tennessee evangelist Johnny Inlow, known for his pro-Trump rhetoric, has 97,000 followers on Facebook, while now 929,000. Anyway, lists all of their, uh, like basically, the people with the big following this that you'd really want to have signed this statement are not signing it. Now, I will say Heidi Baker has signed the statement. Uh, that was the prominent name that I saw and there might be more, but, um, pretty gnarly. You know, yeah. What do you, <laughs> <I'm just laughs> you're kidding. saying, I like Heidi. Saying, I was not, I was not trying to like roast Heidi at all. I was just like, if they're thinking like, Hey, we need, you can't we need high Heidi. names in the NAR community. That's gotta be highest on their list. That seems, that seems pretty high. Am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Lance well now and Dutch sheets. I, I think what these guys add to the, the whole cocktail that Heidi Baker has none of is that nationalism. nationalism. Yeah. The nationalism is really where that, and, and that's where these guys get these massive followings. It's yep. like, if you, if you start intermixing, um, American politics and, uh, with your religion in kind of creepy ways, um, then suddenly you get like this massive following. It's this strange and bizarre thing to me. Yeah, but, if Dutch Dutch and Lance signed this, they would have to repent because that's a that's a huge part of their ministry. Like it's I just signed it, and you cool. can too. Go do that. Did you just there. literally sign it, Miller? I did. Yeah. Wow. While we were on the show, was it because we didn't have, they didn't have enough big names and you were like, I'll give them my name. Is that what you were doing? <laughs> I was like, I was like, <laughs> I'm sure my name will never come up where somebody could see it, but I'm still Hold signing on. it. They need did support. You, they need all the Did you sign it? <laughs> did you sign it as basement boy? <laughs> <laughs> bro that would be hilarious i would love to see that like posted online like <laughs> joseph patera michael basement brown boys, heidi it. baker basement boy <laughs> uh, michael oh, let's, i, I want to respond to that last statement on the those who have failed to sign it uh that's actually a big deal there's a video i've sent you guys uh on, on pm that I, I think we just need to do a review on and it actually has some of those speakers some of those people and influencers uh that have failed to sign this and i think we need to do a review are you saying we should do a whole separate episode on nationalism i think we absolutely should do a whole separate episode on nationalism but specifically this particular uh rally of christian leaders Okay. I, I think so. So let's, let's maybe do this in two parts. And this week we'll, uh, we'll focus on just the kind of theology, ecclesiology of NAR, which is the, uh, the first aspect of, uh, of this. So, uh, maybe we can kind of start to put together some closing statements and thoughts about this statement. And, uh, and Josh, I'll start with you, but in that context, I also want to know, are you going to sign the statement? He's You're muted. muted. You're muted. Rookie. Such a rookie, bro. <laughs> it's like you're turning into my... Oops, muted. Um, anyway, uh, as they're calling me mute, <laughs> calling me a rookie, I just mute their microphones. Um, anyway, the uh, what I was going to say is I have no reservation to sign this document like I had a reservation to sign the other one. I'll probably read it to make sure there's nothing that like jumps out at me, uh, but the, I'll, I'll probably end up signing it, I would imagine. Not that they need like my signature for anything, but yeah. Okay. For it. Now, uh, kind of final closing thoughts on the statement, Josh. Yeah. Uh, the statement is good. 
the statement is moving in the right direction. Uh, charismatic leaders like Dr. Brown have a lot of say in how organizations functions with doctrine and teaching and practice because they're, they're viewed as ecumenical leaders who, who love the charismatic movement. And uh, for him to kind of put his name on the line and cause friction with other charismatic leaders who are kind of more on the nationalistic side and more on the spooky charismatic side, um, I, I think is a good thing. It caused me to respect Dr. Brown uh, more than I do already because I do respect the man, but uh, I respect him even more because this this causes him to lose friendships. You know, this causes him, I don't want to say lose friendships, but it strains those relationships. He's going to do conferences with these guys who are like borderline nationalists. It's, it's going to strain the relationships with people who, you know, are traveling in a third heavens or whatever. So uh, not that he has tons of those friends, but you know what I mean? I'm proud of him. I, I think it's a, it's a big deal that he, he, he wrote the, the thing and, and got it out there. So I'm all for it. Miller? <laughs> yeah. I, I think this is probably less about this statement, more just about a general feeling that I have regarding the NAR world. Um, one of the things I really do hope that happens is anybody who's bought into this stuff, uh, drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, I really wish they would publicly acknowledge that they drank the Kool-Aid and that they've repented and changed the practice. Um, it, I think the thing is, a lot of this stuff actually results in a lot of church hurt, church abuse, and... Uh, the failure to actually acknowledge that this is what I did. You know, like I think of, uh, there was a, a podcast called The Place We Find Ourselves and, and it talks about repentance. And he says, true repentance always looks like this. Oh no, what have I done? And what can I do to make it right? And um, I think I, I would, I'm just, I would be disappointed if people who have practiced this stuff, done this stuff, if all they did was just change their practice. And that's great. Change the practice is good but own what you've done and, and look to make it right. Um, that would be my hope there. And, and as you can see, Brown and others distancing them, themselves from those practices will hopefully cause more people to do that very same thing. Okay. Um, I like that, Miller. And here's how I think I would, I would finish. I want to read a section from Ephesians 4. Uh, so this is actually the part that comes before the, the infamous Ephesians 4.11 about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So there we have the Spirit gifting the body of Christ diversely. But before we come to the diversity of the body, we have the unity of the body. And the diversity of body is actually supposed to lend toward the unity of the body. We're supposed to, uh, to operate in these gifts until we all attain unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So the gifts work toward unity, but they also spring from unity. So let me read. I therefore, Paul says in Ephesians 4.1, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another and love, eager to maintain the unity of of the spirit in the body of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called one hope uh, that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and in all and through all, but in us, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So, um, so before he gets to the grace that was given to each person in different ways for these different giftings, he starts in this place of unity and maintain the unity of the spirit and, and, uh, and so I, I think what I would say is I want to appeal to, to people on both sides. And, and I say, like, listen, you're all our brothers, you, you're brothers and sisters, Holly and Doug, you're my brother and sister and Jesus. And I love you. And, uh, and Joseph and Michael Brown, uh, you're my brothers in Christ too. And, and so I just want us to talk in those ways so we can actually learn from each other. And I look at this statement and I say, I think Michael Brown and Joseph Matera, received this criticism well i look at it and say like they're they're looking at it and say okay you know there there's actually some merit to these criticisms and so they, they received that well i think that's a good thing and uh and i say let's all do that let's learn from each other let's be gentle and kind with one another and a wise person loves correction let's uh let's receive kind of sometimes the hard words but let's also give each other the benefit of the doubt and if if we read something it's like hey, i wish they said it this way i said that like let's just try to give people each other the, the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think Holly and Doug have spotlighted a really key issue in the charismatic church. That's a huge, huge, huge problem. And I also think that Joseph and Michael have responded, uh, pretty well with this statement. I think very well with this statement. So I'd like to see all of us come together in the real spirit of Ephesians four, which is aiming for unity. So, um, 
so we'll we'll kind of finish on that note uh guys thank you so much oh, for wait, joining Michael, us one second yes you mentioned about we're gathering together and like unifying if you want to gather together and unify, you should oh. really come <laughs> to the Remnant 2023 conference on healing and deliverance. It'll March. be full of new revelations. Yeah, they're, they're guaranteed. Oh, yeah, thanks, Miller. Guaranteed the Apostle Michael Roundtree, who's oh, built geez. Bridgeway on, <laughs> oh, on the foundations of apostles and prophets from, from Bethel. Um, it will be a powerful, powerful time of impartation. <laughs> no, seriously, guys, we love we love healing, we love deliverance, and there's a lot of spooky stuff out there. If you've never been trained and or experienced this stuff, this would be a great conference for you to come to and kind of learn about the doctrine of healing, learn about deliverance and how it actually fleshes out. We're going to have uh, live Q and A's uh, for pastors or people who are attending the conference uh, who, who are going to be available during the day on Friday. So it's going to be like a uh, uh, no, it's yeah, it's yeah Thursday evening. Friday uh, morning and evening. There's a Q and A session that morning, and then Saturday uh, all day. So uh, it's going to be a great uh, uh, conference. I might have gotten my dates a little bit wrong, but there is a link in this description, so you can check out the link in the description. Uh, register for the conference. I think we're already halfway full on conference registration, so uh, we Same. only had 200 people. Are we really? Mobile. You really need to go. We're pretty jump far in out for that. Yeah. Snatch that up as soon as you can. So uh, hop on there, get your registration, get your spot taken care of. Uh, it's going to be a, a pretty spectacular conference. Roundtree, let me let me toss it back over to you because I interrupted you. And uh, oh, it's all good. I was you, just going to close, close the show. show. I, I all right, guys. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Remnant Radio. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Helps us out. And uh, and. Uh, if you would consider, if you've benefited from this content, you can make a donation uh, by clicking on the link in the description uh, to PayPal for a one-time donation, or if you'd like to make a recurring donation for as little as $5 a month, uh, then you can join our Patreon Patreon club. So uh, that's probably not what it's officially called, but it's kind of like that. So uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much again for joining us. We will see you next week.